Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning and welcome to Encounter. I'm your host today, Joe Selipak. Women have been in the news a lot recently. In the last election, we elected 98 women to the House of Representatives. This is going to be the largest amount of women within um, Congress that we've ever had. And as a matter of fact, two weeks ago, uh, again, women were in the news when Google um, was being had a walkout um, in in protest of how their management handled uh, the sexual harassment claims of, of various people from within that, that, that uh, business. There was the Women's March in Washington, auxiliary marches that happened all around the country at the same time. Women are, are redefining what it means to be a leader, what it means to be in power, what it means to be, um, and how women should be treated within, within certain areas within our, in our, our, our world. All this proves that women are a force to be reckoned with. Today, with the Me Too movement, we are becoming more aware of the harassment and abuse that women have experienced as they have struggled to, for acceptance. Uh, from Harvey Weinstein to Al Franken and Garrison Keillor, the way men have treated women in recent times has come increasingly under the microscope. Currently, there's a, a Church Too movement, which is talking about how women clergy have been, have been treated within the, the church and how they've struggled for acceptance even within leadership within, within the church. To help me uh, talk a little bit more about women in general and leadership as well as women in the church are, are a couple of clergy. Um, Michelle Bogue-Trost from uh, Central United Methodist Church and Elizabeth Ewing from Christ, Epis Christ Episcopal Church. Um, welcome to Encounter today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's let's begin by talking a little bit about your call to ministry. How did how did you uh, get called into ministry, and and um, maybe some of the some of the, the thoughts that you had that led you to to uh, to choose this vocation for yourself. So for me, it was sort of the family business, and it was a family business <laughs> that I avoided uh, for a number of years. So God's call went a long time. My uh, father's mother, my grandmother, was a graduate of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago and was ordained in the United Church of Christ out of the Congregational Church in 1949. And so that was, that was before I was born. So <laughs> I got to watch her in the pulpit and had a lot of sense of her um, preaching and her views on things like light summer sermons and when you hit people hard <laughs> with the <laughs> message. Um, so that was a piece of it. And so in my family and both sides, there were a lot of time for devotions. My father uh, was also ordained minister and many other relatives. My mother also earned a master's from the University of Chicago. So theology and religion and engaging in church was always very important in our family. Um, and I kind of avoided it by going off in the Foreign Service and being an economist for over 20 years. But in that time, I felt increasingly a call. And over that period, too, we had come out of other mainline Protestant churches, and I felt a real call to a liturgical church. And so after college, became an Episcopalian. I did that in the Diocese of Washington, uh, which is Washington, D.C., and surrounding areas. And so the very first Sunday, uh, Jane Dixon, who was a well-known um, early of the motion in the women clergy, she was leaving from her seminary tour there. So very early on, I experienced women clergy in the Episcopal Church. So I didn't really know much of the repression, didn't realize how long it took them to get to 1976 and really ordaining women. So my call, in a way, went forward well, but I, I ended up being raised up out of the convocation of the churches in Europe. And the churches in Europe had been raising up women for a while, and so I really, um, I found that to be very supportive and very normal, um, but it was a big shift for the family for me to go from foreign service to being um, to being clergy. But they've all been incredibly supportive. Well, you already had some women clergy within your within your family too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, very cool. And Michelle, 
Uh, not the family business. Uh, <laughs> Grew up, did a lot of my growing up in Alabama where I didn't have women clergy to see. Um, grew up in the Methodist Church uh, where we did have women clergy, but not quite in the Southeast as much. Um, I actually started another career. I had a degree and started a whole other career. And then um, when I was home with my daughter um, when she was born, God caught up with me and said, No, you really need to be doing this. And so, um, after, after a time, I went to seminary and, and began this work um, here in upstate New York. Mm-hmm. So, have, um, so when you're thinking about the history of your denomination specifically, so when, did, when, did, um, when, did, when were women ordained uh, within, within the denominations that you come from? Uh, the Methodists have different predecessor traditions, and so different of those traditions ordained women at different times. But the United Methodist Church, what we now know as the United Methodist Church, didn't ordain women and give them full clergy rights until 1956. 1956. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of corresponded with um, right around the, when women were, were getting the right to vote. That'd be a lot after. That'd be a few after. decades after. A few right. decades. So it'd yeah. be like 20 years uh, after. Yeah. Right. All right. And, and the Episcopal right. Church? The Episcopal Church USA, which is part of the Anglican Communion, we um, uh, approved that in 1976, is my understanding. Um, And so it was a while ago, but it's been, you know, 50 years. And um, so it was not done. In fact, women, even up into the 60s, could not be on the vestry, could not serve at the altar. Um, You know, we're not acolytes. We're not, as as laity became more engaged in the ministry, uh, female laity were not there. It was definitely vestry men and not vestry members. Uh, But I missed all of that because I didn't become confirmed as an Episcopalian until 1987. Oh, okay. And and I did it in an environment where... Where women were very active and uh, as leaders, um, as leaders in the church. But I have found, uh, as I've been in Central New York and heard more and more stories of women, heard stories of our um, a bishop uh, who who grew up in uh, Texas, Fort Worth, and her um, experiences as a young woman, really feeling a desire and call to serve um, at the altar uh, as, the, as the younger boys or men were allowed to do and not being able to do that. And so I have come to, um, to get a bigger sense of, of what happened before. Because the United Church of Christ where your, your, my gr- mother. Your, your mother, my grandmother. grandmother was ordained in, was one of the first denominations to ordain women, like mainline denominations. I think so. I think Disciples of Christ was earlier, and there are long traditions of openness in that, but United Church of Christ was one of the, I'm guessing one of the first, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I, I come from a, a holiness background. My, um, my denomination likes to brag that it was uh, during, the, um, during the Second Great Awakening that we, we were ordaining, ordaining women, and women, um, though it took a, a long time, like until recent mm-hmm. decades, before a woman was actually elected into, um, like being the leadership, you know, in, in the for for the mother church, I like to call it the mother church. It's yeah. like, you know, <laughs> you get all the way up to the to the leadership bishops kind of thing. It's a little yeah. bit harder to uh, to be there. Yeah. So, I, I think for most of the mainline traditions, there there's a time lag yeah. between ordination of women and flo- full clergy rights for women and moving into positions of leadership and authority in right. the church. Um, our first woman bishop was elected in my lifetime. So, oh, absolutely, it, yeah. yeah. And and so, um, how on a local level, how were women, how are women received within leadership within churches? Depends on the church. Depends on the yeah. timing. Depends on the context. But right. I think to, to paint it really broadly. Um, there are still churches that refuse to accept women clergy. Mm-hmm. There are still, even in denominations that have ordained women, right. um, there are still churches that say, well, if a woman's coming, we can pay her less. Um, there are still churches that say, um, we're, we're, not going to, we're not going to accept this woman candidate. Bring us a man. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Um, I have found in my own congregation, which began in 1810, that in 2015, when I arrived, I was the first woman rector. Oh, really? The ground was broken nicely by an interim rector just before that. But I was the first female rector, and there were right. definitely people, as I heard later, who did not want a woman called as rector. Right. Um, I feel blessed because people have not left the congregation. We have developed very good relationships. But it is something I still need to uh, tend to. It's something our bishop in this diocese still needs to tend to. And that is one reason that I am very strong in being called Mother Elizabeth, because all the male priests, including some of the retired <laughs> ones in the congregation, are always called Father. And it doesn't really work to be calling someone Father and somebody else by her first name. Um, so I said, Father or Mother. Mother's for our bishop is Bishop. We don't go and tell anybody her first name. And she has definitely not been treated uh, with that respect. And I think we talked about that for a woman, they'll see a woman first or almost think like, wasn't that cute? She's dressing up as this. But um, for a man, they'll see the office first. And I think that as a woman, we are more and more being sure that we are living into this office. But as you were pointing out, we live into it differently. So we are doing this balance because mm -hmm. women tend to be more collegial. They tend to be more encouraging and empowering of other people, which suits the Christian churches now much more because empowering laity is really important um, in all across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but so we have to always balance that I am still your, in my case, I'm still your priest. I can be your friend, I'm your colleague, but I'm still your priest in the end. And I still have the final say on worship, so. And it's, it's remarkable in my career, in my 22 years in the ministry, um, I have been the first woman pastor at the majority of the churches I've served. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, this far into women's ordination, this far into my career, um, I'm still the first woman. I'm the first woman senior pastor at Central. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, you're, I, I presume that you're both aware of the Me Too movement in, in, mm -hmm. in the, the community at large or the world at large. Um, what, is your, what is your opinion about the Me Too movement? And and um, the amount of, uh, does it surprise you, the amount of harassment that, that women have experienced? I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, you're laughing, but it's... No, it's, it's that's ironic. Um, yeah. that's, that's a sense of irony. Um, we've always known. Mm -hmm. We've always known. All women have always known this happens. Um, what I, I think yeah. is amazing about the Me Too movement is that, that finally... Finally, on some levels and in lots of places, people are being listened to. Women are being finally heard and finally being given permission to tell these stories right. um, where we haven't been given permission before. Oh, you just don't worry about it. You know, it's just him. Don't worry about it. Work around him. You know, that's, that's sort of the, the mode we operate under. But Me Too has allowed women to tell their stories in sometimes surprising, sometimes startling ways. Right. Mm -hmm. No, it has. And I think what I was laughing is that and I even talked um, to a nun friend of mine. I was like, every woman has a Me Too story, whether it's actual, you know, physical sexual harassment or on a lower scale. It's just there. And so to finally be able to say it out loud, to, not just to other women, which that was also difficult, but just out loud to anyone. And certainly when all of the hearings were going on in Congress and Me Too, I had uh, people come to me of all ages who just needed someone to, to, hear, to hear the it. story. Yeah. So it goes broader and deeper. So I'm excited about it because it's about listening. And certainly it's about women, but it's also about listening uh, to anyone who has been um, not able to speak uh, back to power or authority. And so like the Episcopal Church at our general convention last summer, we did a liturgy of listening where people had told their stories, but they didn't have to get up and read as her own story. Somebody else did in the context of prayer, in the context of silence and reflection and repentance and a call and a charge to go out and do that so that um, we and our bishop was committed to shining a light on anything, no matter when it happened. So right now, there's a man who has been accused of abusing young males. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now, he's even passed away, but the thought is anybody who might have experienced that come.
tell your story to someone. And be heard. And be heard. It's yes. an incredible pastoral moment for women in this country, I think. Yes. Um, women who have for so long been disregarded or who, who have somehow internalized the notion that we cannot speak our stories, we cannot tell when something like that happens. Um, it's a moment for collective listening. It's a moment mm -hmm. for collective healing. Yes. And that's, that's powerful as leaders in the church for our parishioners who are finding their voices. Um, but it's also powerful within the church as clergy women begin to speak. Um, right. We've for so long been told, you know, the more waves you make, the less, the mm -hmm. less responsibility you'll have, the less leadership you'll have, the less authority you'll be given. Um, you need to go along and get along. Um, and it's been this amazing moment. My, my guests today are, are Michelle Bogue Trost from Central United Methodist Church and uh, Elizabeth Ewing from uh, Christ Episcopal in Binghamton. Um, thank, you for, thank you again for being on Encounter, for sharing your stories. I know that um, when I was putting the show together and inviting women clergy to be on to talk mm -hmm. about this, I, I know that a uh, couple of the, the clergy that I approached said that they couldn't be on because the issue was too raw, too personal, too painful mm -hmm. for them to be on the show and and I understand that and it's and, and it and it's a it's a tough thing so as we're as we're approaching you know the the vocation of minister within mm -hmm. within the the um the church how is how is the the me too movement kind of shifting how how women are perceived within leadership and how does and has there been like me too moments within the church that you're aware of that, um, that you would be comfortable sharing with uh, our audience? That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> I, know, I, 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 like, I like these big questions. I'm sorry, I apologize well, and, for it. And, and what Me Too does, what Church Too does, is, is bring up those big questions in ways that we're not always equipped to answer. Right. Um, that church leadership, church judicatories are not always prepared to answer. I think many of our mainline denominations leadership and judicatory systems were surprised um, mm -hmm. when, when, when clergy women started saying, wait, this is happening in the church too. Right. Um, right. There's, a, there's a wonderful video out floating, floating around Facebook and the internet now made by the women of the ELCA Synod in North Carolina. Um, comments each that are commonly heard by women clergy um, regarding bodies and selves and roles and, as clergy. Um, only this time they have the male clergy reading them. And those stories are powerful. And I don't yes. know a clergywoman who's seen this video who, who hasn't said, oh, I've had all of those said to me at one time or an, another. Um, there's, there's this odd uh, truth that churches, people in churches feel somehow permitted to speak about things to women clergy or about themselves or, or their authority or their role that they would never say to male clergy. Right. That's true. Um, I, ca I cannot begin to tell you how many comments I've had on my appearance. You know, we think about things like, mm -hmm. well, I can't, I can't do anything different to my hair before I preach a really important sermon because that's all anybody's going to talk about is my hair. Um, th that's mild. Uh, women who, that's I have a, much. A colleague who, um, young, who was a young woman, uh, became pregnant, uh, was expecting her first child, and had parishioners who refused to receive communion from her because mm. it was obvious what she'd been doing. Oh. Um, you know, and, and feeling free to make comments about body, yes. self, space, appearance. Um, somehow people in churches still feel permitted to do that where they would never think to with a male pastor. No, and, and I, was, I find that moving way too quickly with familiarity happens a lot yeah. and it comes to this. And um, physical familiarity. And physical familiarity, right? right? ready right? to touch you, <laughs> some 
very inappropriate, but not but most, not, not any here, I have to say that. But, you know, people who would talk, comment on, well, you really need to wear darker lipstick. And I was like, well, do you hear a, a male priest? Does he need to wear a little darker <laughs> lipstick so you understand <laughs> what he's saying? And, and it was extraordinarily helpful to me because our bishop just came and I began to really understand why so many clergy in our diocese were really thrilled to have still sadly among the first female bishops in the Episcopal Church of the small number because she could talk to my vestry and she told them things that she had heard even as bishop you know people just tell her she looked cute oh yeah you know Pat, the head pat head patting and for we who cheek are on the pinching. shorter end cheek pitching what head patting um oh uh, and yeah rear end patting what? oh yeah derriere patting Bless Lots of dairy are happening. <laughs> but there is this, so all of these just happen. Even like she says, I'm in my monitor, I've got my coat. I'm like, we are, because we in Pisgah, we really get dressed up. You could be wearing <laughs> all this stuff. And people would still feel like they could really treat you with the, of the kind of, you know, familiarity or cute little girl thing that um, is entirely inappropriate. Right. And something you do have to balance. And how do you come down with that? And I have had some very good conversations with people. Uh, to help them see, and it comes a lot from like the video from the um, ACLA that the, the ALCA that it it um, say that to a man, see me as a man, right? And how does that sound to you? How would that change? And, and how would it change? And, and there's a there, there, it seems like there's a big struggle that that would go on on that level too. I mean, you just brought it up. You, you're not a man. And you don't want to be a man, I don't right. think. Or no. treated like or one. Treated or like treated like one. On the other hand. On the other hand, <laughs> you know, you, you want to you want to have the respect and the um, and the acceptance and the recognition that comes from being a clergy. So you, you have you have you're walking you're walking an interesting line on that level. It's true. We are, and it's I think that has developed a lot from from the eighties and nineties and you know, we have to act like men in order to be right. treated like men into coming into understanding that the female presence, female authority is is um, sufficient. Right. And um, when I've had congregation members ask me, you know, I don't I don't know how to treat you. I I don't know how to do this with a woman pastor. Mm -hmm. I I just don't know. Help me understand. And I am so grateful when somebody says that. And and my response is. Before you say something, think about whether you would say this to my predecessor or to a male pastor. And if you wouldn't, don't. Just don't. <laughs> right. Save us both the awkwardness and the embarrassment. Right. Um, and it's not always church members. You know, I, I've done weddings before where I, I, can, I can almost predict it. Somebody will say to me, especially earlier in my career, somebody will say to me, well, if all pastors looked like you, I'd go to church more often. Oh, no. You know, and, and that's, <laughs> that is not even somebody I can work with because this is a, a, a wedding just, guest uh, or a wedding relative exactly. who I'll never see again. Um, and how do, you, how do you deal with that? It's, mm. it's random. It's unexpected. It's invasive. It's um, hurtful. And how do you get yeah. How do you lead the wedding after having had right. that experience? Right. It makes it very, very difficult. It yeah. is. And so we walk, but women clergy walk this line all the, all time. the time. Right. Um, from comments delivered right before church. How do you go then and preach the gospel um, when somebody has said something derogatory or sexually explicit to you before a worship service? You know, it's... it's you feel dirty. Or you, invaded. You invaded. You feel more violated or invaded. Mm -hmm. But I guess to me, like you said, you preach the gospel. Then I love to preach the gospel because I know that Jesus was very different. Jesus included women directly from in his the ministry yes. from the beginning. And these were strong figures. If you read, you know, Luke 8, you've got Mary Magdalene was probably a businesswoman. You have Joanna, who was the wife of Herod's right. master house. So you've got the women who were there and they weren't like cooking the meals. They were very active in the ministry. The, you know, your woman at the well, one of the absolute first evangelists who goes to talk to everybody in her town in some area. Mary Magdalene, again, who is in all four of our accounts, the one who was privileged to encounter the risen Christ. So Jesus' encounters with women are extraordinarily encouraging. And sometimes I have to hold Jesus Christ out there and say, okay, 
I know <laughs> your view. <Right. laughs> These folks haven't quite drawn to your heart right. yet, but um, yeah. Well, Michelle and I were talking about that uh, Mary Magdalene piece before, and it's one of the mm -hmm. first times that mansplaining kind of enters into the whole exactly. thing. Exactly. Right? You know, Mary, Mary, and uh, Mary, Mary go to the tomb to dress the body, and they see the tomb is empty, and they go back, and the disciples say, "We don't believe you. We have to check this out for ourselves." Yeah. And that—that that is really the story of women in ministry, women um, following the Jesus way. Uh, has, we just have to prove it somehow. We're being asked to prove um, who we are and what we know. Yeah. Right. That must really get exhausting after a while. It is. Actually, it's that's incredibly yeah. exhausting. It Emotionally, is. physically, yeah. Yeah, no, and when you uh, say that and to prove, so I did, uh, my rector maybe for good or ill reason, um, I put a person on my committee who didn't believe women should be ordained. <laughs> he didn't tell me that either. <laughs> and so I kind of wanted to know, what does call feel like? What does it feel like? What does it feel like? And the other members of the committee were, we believe this whole thing. We want to send her forth. And it took two years. Although at the end, he supported it. But, um, but it was that proving thing. Wow, if I don't think women can be called to ordain minister, to sacramental ministry, as we would do in the Episcopal Church, you have to why prove does it feel to like I have it, to yeah. prove that I have that call and I'm worthy? Right. Yeah. And so we have about 30 seconds before we have to. <laughs> but there's and, and so much more. <laughs> we, yeah, I know. We've just scratched the surface. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't even brought up um, what Galatians says, you know, about in Christ there is neither male nor male female. female. Mm -hmm. Or what Genesis says. Exactly. Let us make them in our own image, male and female. And, and that there is, that within, even within the church, the early church, you had Aquila and Priscilla. Right. Paul's oh, mentioning the women yes. leaders of the so church. People, and and they, yes. were, they were constantly being named. And um, right. I, I just want to thank you both for being on and talking about this subject with us. Because it's important for the, I think it's really important for the future of the church for us to be uh, more in conversation. Opening these, these things yes. up to the light so that um, it can be, can be celebrated. So I want to thank you for your ministry. Thank you for uh, being on uh, on. The, on the, uh, uh, the, show, the Encounter Show this morning. And for all of you, I want to thank you for, uh, for watching today. I want to, I want to uh, offer you a, a, all the blessings of, of, of a good Sunday. Thanks for being on.